On a fateful day in August 2015, I walked into an elevator and something unexpected happened. To set the stage, I was in Houston, Texas, and I was at what's called the Texas Medical Center that has a lot of skyscrapers. I was in one of them. When I walked into that elevator, there was a lovely lady who was holding a bag. And inside the bag, it appeared to be a whole lot of vegetables. There was a gentleman in a suit standing next to me who turned to the lovely lady and he said, Those are beautiful vegetables. Is there a whole market's food on this floor? And she said, No. I was just at my doctor, and after I received a clean bill of health, he said, hold on just a second. I said, "Uh uh-oh, the story's going to change. I thought he was going to come back and give me a prescription. But instead of handing me a prescription, he handed me this bag, and inside the bag were two zucchinis, two tomatoes, and a banana. And the gentleman in the suit said to the lovely lady, what kind of doctor gives you a prescription of vegetables and not Savaldi or amoxicillin? And she said, you haven't met my doctor. My doctor is named Joe Galati, and his prescription for me is vegetables. I'm Chuck Garcia. Welcome to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation. My guest today is Dr. Joe Galati. Joe is a hepatologist, which means that he spends his life in the service of treating liver disease. He is also the author of a wonderful book called Eating Yourself Sick, How to Stop Obesity, Fatty Liver, and Diabetes from Killing You and Your Family, which may give you a clue as to why his prescription was vegetables. He is also one of my best friends. Joe has been in my life for 41 years. We met when I was an 18-year-old freshman at Syracuse University, and he lived diagonally across from me in the dorm. And I bless the day that I met him. Dr. Joe Galati, one other thing that I should mention, he is also a radio host. And for the past 17 years, he has hosted and continues to a radio show on KTRH in Houston called Your Health First. I have had the pleasure of being on that show many times, and here we are in a role reversal. I'm now delighted and honored to be able to welcome to the studios of 77 WABC my friend, Dr. Joe Galati. That's a great twist, Chuck. Well, Joe, I know many people who go to doctors walk out with a piece of paper that has been written with something whose handwriting we usually don't understand. Right. They go to a pharmacy. They are handed a pill or a potion or a lotion, whatever that may be. But you have a different idea about how you practice medicine. Tell the listening audience what it means to treat liver disease and why you give vegetables. Well, liver disease, the the one thing about liver disease compared to the heart or lung disease, um, liver disease is not sexy, but it is very, very deadly. And the other thing about liver disease is that it's silent. People do not know they have liver disease. And so I see patients very late in the term of their disease. If you've got heart problems, you may have chest pain, you may have shortness of breath. People know that they should go to the doctor. But with liver disease, they go on for years or decades and only come to me at the very end stage. And my mission, in a sense, is to try to raise awareness to understand your liver, ask questions, and not see me when you literally are half dead. Now, the vegetable part is today we are seeing that the, really the number one disease we're seeing is something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease related to obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems. That is in turn related to a bad diet. 
uh, we are eating ourselves sick and people don't realize it. And so doctors and nurses are trained. They'll see you, they'll say, you know what, you need to lose weight, eat more fruits and vegetables. Okay, eat more fruits and vegetables, that makes sense. But the reality is people don't know the different vegetables, how to pick them out, how to prepare them. And so when they get confused, they walk back to the frozen food aisle and will buy processed foods. I decided let's hand out vegetables and try to educate our patients. Well, this is interesting because the discussion that we had had in the elevator was that she said, and she used it in the term, my prescription was vegetables. And her particular point of the kind of doctor that I go to, I guess he could write a prescription, but how blessed I am that he actually handed me something, not because he told me to do it, he actually gave me what to do. It, That's a startling, Joe, I, I, I've met many doctors and they're, they're all wonderful in what they do. You are a horse of a different color. We, we live in a, a pill mentality. So people are, are ill, and I'll be having a 20, 30-minute conversation with someone. At the very end, they will say, uh, am I going to get a prescription for this? And I said, yes, I am going to give you a piece of broccoli. And they laugh, and they're not quite sure what I mean by that, but I will uh, signal to somebody and an acorn squash or uh, uh, you know some of the root vegetable uh, we have on hand and we'll give out. So it is trying to change that paradigm of the experience when you go to the doctor. It's very different now when you come and see us. That's yeah. the fun part. No, it's the fun part is I get to see my doctor and walk out with some pretty good vegetables. Let's rewind the clock. I want to do a little bit of nostalgia here for one reason. I have had the great pleasure of watching your transformation. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, to the extent that I've had one, you have watched mine. We have been in each other's lives without interruption since September of 1978 when we met on That's my right. first day at Syracuse University. What I know is you and I, at that early age of 18, were looking beyond the horizon. I wanted to go to Wall Street, you wanted to go to med school, and you wanted to be able to cure the sick. And while we both had our own notion in our minds, we worked hard, we were both studious, there was going to be a path that was going to get us to reach our goals and objectives. But your path was a bit jagged and unconventional compared to some other bio majors that went directly to med school. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the points of those transformation and the challenges that you had to face in order to stay on that path. Well, to, to be absolutely honest, I wanted to be a physician since I was five years old. In now, fact, you now, use the word always. Yeah. That always oh, rung always. in my I mean, head. I, I've had lots of interest, uh, 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 love to read, but being a doctor, being a physician was the number one thing, and that was my goal. And so at Syracuse, follow, get plugged into the usual format, pre-med, biology, organic chemistry, and then somewhere in your third year of college, you take the MCAT uh, uh, standardized exam. And I did okay. I did not do great. So what did I do? I said, that's the target. Let me take it again. Let me work even harder. Took it a second time. Not really much better. Took it a third time. I actually did a little worse, which... <laughs> but you kept swinging. I kept swinging. I'm like, I've got to get there. And I uh, finally took it a fourth time, which when I t told that to people, they really thought I was brain dead. You're taking... Nobody takes it four times. I said, but I have to get there. Applied to medical schools, went on interviews, waitlisted, and got turned down by everybody. And when I got my final rejection letter... I sat there, I was actually with my sister Anne, and I opened it up and I said, these fill-in-the-blank people are denying me my dream. What am I going to do? Are, are they right? Do I not belong in this field? And I said, absolutely not. And I found another pathway looking abroad. I was at the point where I was almost going to go to Bangalore, India to go to medical school. You didn't tell me that yeah. when we were yes. 18, that you were yes. going to say, oh, I think I'll go uh, to uh, India. Bangalore. I looked at <laughs> Poland. I looked at Italy. I looked at Mexico. And finally, I ended up going to medical school on the small island nation of Grenada in 1983. Six months later, there was an invasion there that I had a, a front row seat for. 
uh, got to meet President Reagan on two occasions, which was a nice byproduct. But there again, it was, hey, I got into medical school, and then a pile of rocks fell on me. And I said, okay, dust off, keep going. And uh, uh, the rest has been sort of history, but it's it's been a, a a hard road the entire time. Uh, but before we get, I want to continue on the hard road, but I do want to relate, which was a Joe Galati story. And I remember to our listeners that are too young to remember, the U.S. Army swooped in, or the Marines, I don't know who they were, on helicopters. And there was a coup, I don't remember the details, but what we saw on the television is there was a lot of shooting. Yes. You came and you visited us and you had tape recorded the shootings. And you said, guys, it's in my backyard. Listen to this. And we heard bullets and bombs. And, and you said, I wouldn't have gotten this if I had gone to NYU or Columbia Medical School. That's right. I survived an invasion. And then Clint Eastwood made a movie about it a year later, and you and I had a really good laugh. But what I loved about that part of the story, Joe, it was part of your story. And you continued to swing. And I see that as your first transformation. And you went through the medical school outside of the U.S., and you continued to persist in finding your way back to America. What happened? Well, you know, um, I uh, did well in medical school. I was able to land one of the top residency training programs in the United States here in, in uh, New York City. Um, but along the way, you were always looked at as a second-class citizen. You were not good enough to go to NYU. You were not good enough to go to Cornell. You were to go to this small, uh, somewhat no-name medical school. But I would say that the training and drive was better than anybody. When you have to work hard, scrap fingers and nails, you appreciate it and, and you realize that you've got a mission rather than something you just walked into and uh, just went through the steps. And so um, we we got back, did my residency, did my uh, liver disease and transplant training at University of Nebraska, probably one of the finest places in the world to uh, be trained. And then I got recruited by University of Texas in the world famous Texas Medical Center. That was 25 years ago. So Regardless of what these people said, you are not good enough to get into medical school, according to our standards. Right. Years later, I am at the pinnacle of my career overseeing one of the finest liver transplant programs in the country. Well, this is such a great story because here you are facing an opinion that the rest of the world was shining down on you. And while that was something that you had to face... Your confronting of that situation was really taking responsibility for what the rest of the world may think and figuring out, I have to take an alternative path. And you did. That brought you right back to the U.S. It, you're all about transformation. And for, for everybody listening, whether you are a student, you're early in your career or mid-career, transformation for me is a commitment. Mm -hmm. It is a well thought out plan of attack that you have to implement over months to years. Okay. Another word that people use is pivot. To me, pivot is something that's going to happen at a meeting right now. You're in a meeting and something's not going your way. And on the dime, you have to, you have to change your mind uh, right there at that moment. But transformation is you're basically to me, as, as the non-business executive, saying you are committing to a change that you're going to be faithful to and ride it to the point that you get to the end and you're successful. Indeed, what you're describing, Joe, is the difference between what is strategic and what is tactical. Transformations, to me, are strategic. There right. is an intent. Pivoting is tactical. It's in reaction to something right. else. You are tuned into a climb to the top, Stories of Transformation on Talk Radio 77 WABC. I'm Chuck Garcia, and my guest this evening is Dr. Joe Galati. Joe, we were talking about the difference between the strategy and the tactics, and you really strategized your way to continue the path to your dreams so that you could continue to live them. 
But it seems when you went to Texas, in my following your path, there was another transformation that was brewing. And before I say that, I want to draw the distinction that I got to watch your transformation that to me, what was foundational about it is you were a different kind of physician. You didn't, to me, live up to the stereotype. You had a skill for bedside manner that I think would be the envy of any physician, yet it seems they don't teach that in med school. Was that a strategic consideration to develop that skill, or did it just happen organically? It It was part of the plan. It was not a casual mistake I fell into. I knew I could talk with people, I could make them relaxed, and get the information out of them. But at the same time, Chuck, in listening to patients, I was realizing that they were very unhappy with the care they were receiving elsewhere. And I started to get a lot of second opinions, third opinions, fourth opinions. People were coming with 10 years worth of records. And I'm like, why did you leave Dr. X? You've been seeing him. He didn't tell me what I had. He didn't listen. He was looking at his watch. He was rushing out. So now I said, aha, yes, I like to communicate. Yes, I like to talk. Yes, I like to tell stories. We're going to capitalize this and make a, in a sense, a business around this. And I told my staff that you have to realize that these patients are coming and we, we cannot have them fall into the same trap and say, aha, Dr. Galati is no better than the people I came from. We have to make it different. So we built it really from the bottom up where we tell stories, we listen to patients, we sit down, we ask about their families, their careers. Uh, how uh, are they a football fan, a basketball fan? We get into all of this relax them, and they love coming to us. And so I realized that we can provide care by sitting down and communicating with them. And over years, people have said, you really are a physician communicator. And, And that's a term that I like having on my back, in a sense. Well, one thing we talk about, even in the business world, that I've always tried to differentiate myself, but I see this in you, is you pull something out of Maya Angelou's playbook. And she said a lot of very wonderful, wise things. But every time I see you, and I've been in the operating room with you, you took me into some surgeries, I've been on rounds with you. And every time I'm on rounds with you, as you go from patient to patient, all I can think about is that Angelou quote, that says they may forget what you said, and they may even forget how you said it, but they never forget how you make them feel. And and I've seen your patients under enormous stress and anxiety because they're dealing with the unknown themselves. You have a wonderful way of doing it. Did that lead you to consciously want to be different? I, you know, I, I believe that... I I felt I had a tremendous responsibility. In liver disease, we deal with very, very sick people. We are telling people bad news every day. And I I practice my, in a sense, my script with patients, and I found how honest I have to be, how forthright, and how consoling I I have to be with them. And that just worked. Uh, And, uh, you know, I can't say that I ever had a a, a family meeting with patients and it went bad because I told them bad news. You have to understand, in a sense, your client, what they're they're saying. But the other thing is I realized that uh, back 20, 25 years ago when the Internet was just becoming the thing, the medical profession was like, don't go on the Internet. That's bad. Don't promote yourself. And uh, patients would say... Um, hey, I went to the doctor and I, I printed out some things from the internet and he told me that's garbage, don't look at it. I turned it around and I said, number one, we're going to create our own content. Number two, show me what you bring and I will say, this is bad, this is not too bad and this is good information, work with them on that. And so we've been able, in a sense, to leverage social media to the point where the vast majority of our referrals, like 65%, are coming from the web. Well, knowing you, you didn't see this as a burden at all as others did. You saw this as an opportunity to get it right. Well, you know, this is what I, I always say patients are consumers, no different than when you go buy 
a refrigerator at Sears. Yeah. You know, you have to understand the client. And so I figured they're on the internet, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're on, uh, you know, YouTube. Make your own material yeah. and let them look at what you're doing and uh, have them uh, feel comfortable with it. So even though you started to command what you wanted to on the internet, something very interesting happened along the way. You sat in my living room and you explained to me back in 2003, Chuck, I'm going to do a radio show and I'm going to call it Your Health First. What do you think? And I said, oh, well, first, I'm not surprised you're doing a radio show because you've always demonstrated communication skills. This was a part of your transformation. I don't think that I saw coming but was very important for you to achieve something. What is that? Well, you know, uh, every day we see patients one at a time. Mm -hmm. You come, come with your wife, your children, and we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. The radio was something that now you're talking to many more, hopefully, than one person, two people, a hundred people, a thousand people. And the message can get to so many other people, and at the basis of it, it's helping people. We're getting back to the liver disease, early diagnosis, early intervention. If you're listening and you hear something, you could go home and say, wait a second, am I at risk for a certain disease? Do I need to stop drinking? Do I need to get tested for hepatitis C? And that is how it all works. But I, I realized pretty early that through some sort of mass communication, be it radio or TV, you could touch so many more people, and if you do it right, they will follow you. Well, I think you also do something that I love about your radio show that I think is a, listen, a lesson to our listeners. I have been honored to be on your show many times, but I'm just one of probably hundreds, if not thousands. It seems your health first is a faculty. You bring on physicians, people from all walks of life, and you help educate us not to take a pill that's not what I get out of your show. What is your show? What's it about? Well, you know, we, we want to put your health first. Yeah, good title. Uh, in front and center. Long ago, uh, uh, an expert in radio said, look, you don't have guests. You have experts on right. the show. So we always get the top people. Even if somebody wrote the lead article New England Journal of Medicine, and maybe it's a rat study, not a human person, I will get them on the phone and say, look, there is application to uh, uh, humans in this. Can you, can you explain how the rat study that you may, you know, most physicians may not understand it, how you could sort of transform that into everyday language? There's no doctor talk. It's very simple. And that, in a sense, defangs uh, everybody that's that's listening in. So the idea is to get experts, share with them the research, the technology, the know-how that is out there in all facets of health and wellness. And you've been on the program, and we talk about uh, wearable clothing in, in the form of exercise. We love to talk about food and cooking and nutrition. So this the space of wellness is gigantic, and we try to cover all of those aspects. And again, I look at it strictly as an extension of me and my practice and the people that I work with. It's another uh, another uh, piece of light in the entire spectrum of wellness, really. Well, all of this, Joe, to help differentiate yourself, when I walked into that elevator and they were talking about you as she was holding that bag of vegetables, it just blew my mind, that's my friend Joe. And Joe has made a conscious decision to be different in a world. You are a green apple in a red orchard. How does it feel, because I don't know what it's like to be a doctor, to, to help a patient through what is a, a, a grave illness to help heal them back to a better place? I would say it, it is the greatest job in the world, maybe next to clergy. Uh, but you have someone that comes in desperate for help. They want to feel better. They want to live. And so many adult patients say, I want to live to see my children graduate high school or college, or I want to see my grandchildren grow up. So this is, in a sense, added pressure 
honest to say, look, we're not just treating this guy. He's thinking about his whole family, and that's the responsibility that we have. And we work hard, again, to bring up the liver disease story. It's very serious. We are not able to cure everybody. But we, when we make those cures or we get them back to health, it is such a great feeling where patients from 20 years ago are still sending me Christmas cards and pictures of them on vacation. And they will say, and, and I work truly as a team, but they send it to me and they'll say, Dr. Galati, thank you very much for what you have done. No matter what kind of a bad day you think you might be having, you get a postcard like that and you're like, look, life is very good. And to, to, to recap here, I'm trying to put myself in the position of, of a patient because I want to be able to give our listeners and our viewers some takeaways because I think you've got such an enormity of them because you have dared yourself to be different and sure. you live it every day. How many pounds of vegetables do you buy every day? <laughs> uh, probably about 10. We have just passed the one ton, uh, okay, 2,000 pounds. So, uh, so, uh, so, so we truly really have given a ton of vegetables away. Yeah, that's awesome. We can say on the radio, Dr. Galati is not only a hepatologist and a liver specialist, he has given to his patients over one ton <laughs> of fruits and vegetables. When others may have given one ton of medications, That's right. let food be your medicine. Yes. Let medicine be your food. I can't think of any greater theme. Well, Dr. Gladi, let's leave our listeners and viewers with some key takeaways that they drew from your experience. Reflect, if you will, on your, what I think are two transformations. What are the lessons that we can recap that we're going to leave them? Let's keep it in three. I would say, regardless, you don't have to be a physician. You have to, when you, whatever dream you have, go for it. Change to get where you want to go and, and realize you are going to be ridiculed. Right. We didn't really talk about that too much, but you have to be willing to take a little bit of heat and uh, be different. But in your heart, you know the end point is where you want to go. The second thing is be a good communicator. If you are a God-given good communicator, fantastic. If not, hone in your skills. I do not believe that anybody is beyond improving and communicating. The last thing, sincerity. You have to, you know, I tell students that I work with, when you are insincere, it is a stink that does not come off and people pick it up a mile away. So being sincere and truthful to yourself and the people you work with those three, and you'll you'll get where you want to be and be happy. And where, Dr. Galati, can listeners find you? The easiest way is probably just go to drjoegalati.com. Everything we do is somehow posted there or linked. That's the only website I would say the listeners should go to. Well, after 41 years, I'm going to tell you something I've never told you before. Uh-oh. You are the world's greatest salesman. You know why? Because you're selling health and happiness. That's right. And I don't think there's a better product out there. Thank you, Chuck. Thank really you, Joe, for it. coming on to our show. I'm Chuck Garcia. You have tuned into another episode, and we're blessed for you having done that to a climb to the top. Stories of transformation on Talk Radio 77 WABC. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs>